from the third century, uh, each of them writing in different ways about the Lord's Prayer. And these three authors are Tertullian, Cyprian and Origen. Uh, the book that I've been using to prepare this material uh, is published by St. Vladimir's Seminary Press in America uh, and it's a translation of three different writings uh, by uh, Alistair Stuart Sykes who has produced other translations uh, in the series of popular patristics for St. Vladimir's Press. Uh, each of the writers, Tertullian, Cyprian and Oregon, take a slightly different uh, approach when they are writing about the Lord's Prayer, as we will come to see. Uh, and perhaps at the very beginning we can say that Tertullian, uh, I think, takes a practical approach, uh, Cyprian takes uh, a more spiritual approach, and Oregon takes what we might call uh, a mystical approach. And perhaps this will be unfolded as we work through this presentation. Unlike some of the other presentations I have uh, prepared and recorded, uh, there will not be a lengthy historical introduction uh, because quite quickly we need to get uh, down to the texts themselves and much of this presentation uh, will be a study of uh, excerpts, very short excerpts from each of these three writings to give us a flavour of them. Uh, if we do introduce these three uh, authors, uh, all of them are well known to us. Tertullian lived in Carthage in North Africa and he was born about 155 AD and he died in about 240 AD. Uh, he was a non-Christian by birth, a pagan, and he converted about 197 AD, so in his adult years. Uh, when he became a Christian he was a, a prolific a teacher and, and author, and many of his writings have come down to us, uh, but he was writing in Latin because Carthage in North Africa uh, was a colony of Rome and so spoke Latin uh, as did the Roman church. Uh, it is considered that Tertullian was influenced by Montanism, and this leads uh, some Orthodox to consider that he is uh, rather a dangerous influence or, or author uh, in the church and not especially a father and it's true he has never been considered a saint uh, but Montanism was a heresy which spread throughout the church in uh, the second and early third centuries uh, it was essentially a, a movement of rigorism a, a desire to go back to really putting some effort into the Christian life uh, and in uh, modern Turkey, in, in Asia Minor, where it, it first began, it, it did become properly a heresy. Uh, and there were a number of women who were considered prophetesses and, and Montanus, after whom the heresy was named, uh, went too far and uh, ended up uh, entering into heresy and teaching falsehood. But uh, hundreds of miles away in North Africa, uh, the Montanism that Tertullian seems to have been influenced by was much more this sense that Christians needed to get back to making an effort in their Christian life, to be rigorous, uh, to be ascetic. Uh, and he never appears to have left the church uh, and gone into any sort of schism or, or, or heresy himself. Uh, the writing that we're looking at in this uh, book is called De Oratione, On Prayer. And uh, we will see that it is a relatively short text uh, and it was written for a specific audience that we will consider in just a moment. Cyprian was also from Carthage in North Africa uh, and almost at the same time as Tertullian. Uh, he converted also himself from, from paganism in about 245 AD, so just a few years after Tertullian had fallen asleep in the Lord. Uh, and the difference between Tertullian and Cyprian is, is that Cyprian very quickly uh, became well known as uh, a, an important member of the church in Carthage and just four years after having become a Christian uh, he found himself made uh, the Bishop of Carthage uh, somewhat against his will but by the popular desire of, of the church there in that city. Uh, as bishop, he faced a great controversy in his time uh, over what to do with those who had given in 
under persecution. Uh, we know that uh, many resisted uh, offering incense to the emperor. Uh, many of them were martyred, uh, even in our own church uh, in Alexandria. Uh, but in Carthage, as well as everywhere else, there were those who said, this doesn't really matter. Uh, the emperor isn't a god. I can offer incense and it means nothing. And after the persecution had ended, many of these people wanted to come back to the church. And the church was not sure how to deal with them. Uh, when the church welcomed some of them back after a period of repentance and a period of uh, probation, there were those in North Africa who insisted that this was not the Christian response and that these people should never be allowed back into the church. Uh, and so there was a schism in parts of North Africa. And this was one of the things that Cyprian had to deal with. Uh, those who were unwilling under any circumstances to allow those who had given way under persecution to come back into the church. Uh, he himself was martyred in 258 AD. Uh, and uh, his text is called On the Lord's Prayer. And we'll see that it has a slightly different flavour to that of Tertullian. But in fact, Cyprian uh, relied on Tertullian very much and respected him as someone a little before him uh, in time uh, and drew often on his writings in his own thinking and teaching. Uh, and the third of our authors uh, is Oregon. Again, we can see from the dates that he lives at about the same time, 184 AD to about 253 AD. Uh, and we could easily have a whole lecture only looking at any one of these figures, especially Oregon. Uh, he was born in Alexandria, and unlike the other two authors, his father, his, his family, was Christian. And in fact, his father, Leonides, was martyred and was, was well known and honoured as a martyr. Uh, he was martyred when Oregon was still uh, only a child. Um, Oregon is rather different to Tertullian and Cyprian in that from the beginning he, he developed a, a character as a scholar and a philosopher and a teacher uh, rather than uh, a catechist, someone who gives instruction in the church or a bishop as Cyprian was. Uh, he was always thinking on a slightly different plane uh, and sometimes his thinking went beyond the bounds of what was accurate and acceptable and, and so he came under criticism later on in, in centuries after uh, his own death. But at the time he was highly respected uh, and many of the great fathers, the Cappadocians, uh, the Gregories and St Basil the Great, uh, they respected and highly valued his spiritual teachings at least, uh, even where some of his speculation went too far. Uh, he came under uh, some controversy because when he was visiting Caesarea in Palestine, he travelled all over the Mediterranean, uh, he was ordained as a priest. And the patriarch in Alexandria took this uh, very badly uh, and excommunicated him. And uh, Oregon spent the, the rest of his life living and working in Palestine and couldn't uh, easily go back to Alexandria. Uh, he himself suffered persecution and he was tortured under the Roman authorities in 250 AD uh, and he died uh, of those uh, injuries to a great extent in 253 AD. He also has produced a text called On the Lord's Prayer uh, but if you are able to access the book or, or find the writings online you will see that his explanation is, is much longer uh, he's much more concerned with understanding uh, how it is that we pray, how it is that we enter into uh, communion and union with God. Uh, and he bases his thinking around the Lord's Prayer, but he is not writing a simple explanation of those words from the Gospel. Uh, he's much more concerned to present a treatise, a, a longer text, on what it is that prayer really is. Uh, and we will also see, or you will see, if you can read the whole of the book, that he looks at what words mean. Uh, he, he's very interested in uh, the origin of, of different words, languages. Um, he's not just giving a simple explanation of what uh, the text in the scriptures mean. It's a very different uh, explanation of the Lord's Prayer, uh, and it's for a different audience, as we're about to see. 
the Lord's Prayer we find in, in Matthew and Luke, and they're very similar. Uh, I have marked in blue where uh, the text in Luke differs from Matthew, and then at the very end I've marked in red where the text in Matthew is different to Luke. Uh, and so reading it we read our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven that's the same in both texts and then there's a little difference give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors uh, and in Luke we read give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us uh, and then both versions read and do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one uh, and then in only the one of the versions do we read for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen uh, clearly both gospel writers are talking about uh, the same words uh, but they are also writing out of their own experience of praying these prayers uh, and we can imagine, even in our own experience today, if we go to different churches, we find that we are using slightly different words to express exactly the same thing. Uh, and this gives us um, one insight into the fact that the gospel writers were not concerned with writing down word by word exactly uh, what they had heard and seen. They were more concerned with sharing the content and the substance. Uh, it's Protestantism which is especially concerned to try and find the original words uh, as if they will have some special value. But we believe that the inspiration is not only in the speaking of the Lord Jesus, who is God himself, but it's also in the recalling and the writing down, which uh, is found in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. So we can accept that both of these are inspired accounts of the Lord's Prayer, uh, and both of them represent forms of this one prayer which were used in the first century and which continue to be used. What was the purpose of these three writings? Uh, again, if you're able to read the book, uh, the author goes into some detail. But Tertullian seems to be speaking to catechumens. A catechumen is someone who has given in their name and registered to be prepared for baptism, especially at the feast of Pascha, of the resurrection. Uh, and Tertullian has already written a book on repentance and he's already written a text on baptism. Uh, it would seem natural to put this uh, third text on the Lord's Prayer into that sort of collection of writings which were prepared for those uh, who were getting ready to be baptised. Uh, and Tertullian, uh, as I have intimated, uh, he seems to take a very practical and straightforward approach to the Lord's Prayer, which we will see as we look at some of his words. Uh, the text in, in the book that we're looking at, uh, there are additional questions uh, after he speaks about the Lord's Prayer. Uh, and it would seem that even in the time of Tertullian, he was putting together, as many of our priests or bishops might putting together a little text which was useful for a variety of things, not only to speak about the Lord's Prayer, but to deal with some of the questions about how do we practically pray, what should be our dress, how should we speak. Um, Cyprian, writing a little bit later, also seems to be speaking to catechumens. But the difference is that he is speaking as a bishop, uh, and he seems to me to be communicating a more spiritual understanding of the Lord's Prayer, as we'll see when we look at some of the excerpts from his book. Uh, we note in, in his teaching that he speaks about how the Lord's Prayer is the first prayer which the newly baptised person prays after they have been baptised. And so it does seem to make sense that uh, his own teaching is to do also with the preparation of those getting ready for baptism. Uh, but Oregon uh, is writing probably in Caesarea after he has had to leave Alexandria. Uh, and his text, much longer, much more detailed, uh, much more interested in the origins of words and things like that. Uh, his text is concerned with instruction in the whole life of prayer. Uh, he's, he's basing it on the Lord's Prayer, but he wants us to have 
uh, a mystical experience and understanding of the gospel teachings about prayer. Uh, he doesn't want us just to know what it means, but he wants it to have a transforming effect uh, on our lives uh, and be part of that uh, journey into union with God. Uh, for the next three slides, we're just going to look uh, at, at a couple of sentences each from Tertullian, Cyprian and Oregon, which gives an idea of what their own understanding is when they come to speak about the Lord's Prayer. Uh, what is the context that we should put it in? And so this is from Tertullian. Jesus Christ, our Lord, marked out for his new disciples of the new covenant a new form of prayer. Whatever was of the old has either been transformed, as has circumcision, or else completed, as was the remainder of the law, or fulfilled, as prophecy has been, or perfected, as is faith itself. The gospel has been introduced as the completion of everything of antiquity, and the new grace of God has renewed all things from fleshly being into spiritual being. Uh, and so when we're thinking about what Tertullian comes to say, we should put it in the context of his idea that in the new covenant, uh, in the New Testament times after the resurrection, there is a new form of prayer. Uh, and this is why the Lord Jesus has given us the Lord's Prayer. It, it gives us something new in our relationship with God. Uh, all that was of the past has been transformed or completed or fulfilled uh, and now we have something new. Uh, and now even the, the life of prayer of the Old Testament of the Jews, which was one of the sacrifice of animals, uh, it has now been changed from being a fleshly, earthly thing into a spiritual way of prayer. And so when we think of Tertullian and his writings in a minute, we need to be thinking that he's understanding this as something new. Uh, as something renewed and as something spiritual in place of the old and the earthly. Uh, and when we look at Cyprian, we can read these sentences. The instructions of the gospel, dearest brothers, are nothing other than divine commands, foundations on which hope is built, buttresses by which faith is strengthened, food by which the heart is fed, directions by which our journey is guided, bulwarks by which salvation is attained while they instruct the minds of those who are learning the faith on earth they are leading us to the heavenly kingdoms and so uh, it seems to me that where Tertullian is describing yes that something new has come uh, here Cyprian is speaking about how the gospel and and the Lord's prayer within the gospel is actually taking us on a journey uh, we're on a spiritual journey when we pray with the words of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, Tertullian says that the words of the Lord's Prayer, we can say, are spiritual words, that they're a new way of connecting with God. And here St. Cyprian is extending that so that we have the sense that when we pray, when we embrace the teachings and the words of the Gospel, uh, we are on a journey where we are heading and going towards the heavenly kingdoms. Uh, and so we have to have that in mind when we think of St. Cyprian and his writings in a minute. Uh, we're on a journey and the, the Lord's Prayer together with the other instruction in the Gospels is to take us from one place to another, uh, to bring us closer to the heavenly kingdom uh, so that we are progressing through our life in a spiritual way. And then finally, Oregon, uh, a few sentences from his introduction, Nobody knows what is of God apart from the Spirit of God. Now, if no one knows what is of God apart from the Spirit of God, it is impossible that a human might know what is of God. Yet take good note how it becomes possible. We did not receive the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is from God, so that we might know whatever is freely granted us by God. Now, this passage doesn't seem even to speak about the Lord's Prayer or prayer at all. Uh, and it's because it seems to me that in Oregon, uh, he is concerned with us coming to know God. He's concerned with us receiving all of those graces 
and, and the gift of the Holy Spirit which God pours out with us. So in Oregon, even beyond the practical, this is what the Lord's Prayer means, even beyond the spiritual that it leads us on a journey towards God, he wants us to understand that prayer is the reception and the participation uh, in the spirit which God gives us. Uh, it is a mystical response to the Lord's Prayer because it is to deal with our experience of becoming united with God uh, as we pray and while we pray. Uh, so I think we will see these three slightly different approaches uh, as we come now to look at the texts. Uh, what does Tertullian say of the Lord's Prayer? Uh, whatever is heavenly is of the Lord Jesus Christ, as is this rule of prayer likewise. To pray in secret, by which he demands that a person believe, in the ability of the Almighty God to hear and to see, and desires a proportionate faith, that he should trust him who is everywhere to hear and to see. We should not consider going to God with an army of words, a whole summary of the gospel is to be found in this prayer. You can see that I've had to cut down his words and he writes many more. Uh, but I want to say uh, that there are perhaps three things in just this very short passage. Firstly, he wants us to know that when we pray, we need to be sure and believe with faith that God hears and sees us. Uh, that we already have an experience of God where he is not far from us and distant, but wherever we pray, when we pray in secret in our room, uh, when we pray quietly in our heart, we are to believe that God is with us and sees us and hears us. Uh, and secondly, he says, we should not go with an army of words. Uh, and this, it seems to me, is, is an important aspect of, of our orthodox understanding of prayer. We do not need many words. We need a fervency and a warmth of heart when we pray. But it is enough for us to pray the Lord's Prayer. And when we pray that with attention and, and with desire uh, and with concentration, it says everything. Uh, because thirdly, the whole summary of the gospel is to be found in this prayer. Uh, if we understand it properly, there is nothing more that needs to be said. Because we find in it our own weakness and our own need for repentance. And we find, on the other hand, God's mercy and compassion uh, his salvation and his provision of all that we need. Uh, this is rather a practical way of looking at the Lord's Prayer. Uh, when you pray in secret, do not use lots of words and believe that God can hear you and see you. But that's a necessary lesson for us to have when we pray, uh, because we can very easily believe that we need to make very long prayers, explaining in detail everything we want God to do. But it is enough even for us to pray in, in the short words of the Jesus prayer. Uh, My Lord Jesus Christ, help me. Uh, this also the church finds contains the whole of the gospel. Uh, when we look at Cyprian in, in his initial sentences on the Lord's Prayer, he says this. Indeed, what prayer could be spiritual other than that which Christ, by whom the Holy Spirit is sent to us, has given us? What prayer could be truer in the presence of the Father than that which was conveyed by the Son who is truth from his own mouth? That we should pray in a manner distinct from that he taught is not ignorance alone, but is culpable. Here we see again, as I've said, that Cyprian is interested uh, in the spiritual aspect of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, we are to pray in spirit and in truth, uh, and the words which our Lord Jesus have given us are both spirit and truth. How could they be otherwise? Uh, how could we learn to pray in a way that pleases God and brings us into his presence other than in the words which God himself has given us to pray? Uh, in my own evangelical background, we did not pray the Lord's Prayer because we believed that prayer should only be from uh, the head and spontaneous. And we believed that this was only a model to show us how we might create our own prayers. But here is St. Cyprian saying, uh, what are we doing if we are not praying the Lord's Prayer? How can there be a more spiritual prayer than this one which God himself has given us uh, by the Holy Spirit? Uh, and so it is necessary for us in the spiritual life to turn often to the Lord's Prayer. 
Uh, not only is there a practical benefit, but there is a spiritual benefit. Because when we offer these words rather than any others, we are offering the words that God himself has given us to pray. Uh, and then Oregon says... It is an obligation on us not only to pray, but also to pray as we ought and to pray for what we ought. For if we know the things for which we ought to pray, this is inadequate unless we also grasp the manner in which we ought to pray. But what benefit is it to us if we know how we should pray, if we do not know what we ought to request? One concerns the words, the other the disposition of the one who prays. Oregon is saying to us that there are two aspects to our prayer. Uh, what should I pray and how should I pray? Uh, and unless we have both of them, our, our prayer is deficient. Uh, if I do not know what to pray for, then it does not matter how I pray, I, I will not pray aright. Uh, if I know what I want to pray for, but I do not know how to pray, then my prayer will not be fruitful. Uh, and here we find the disposition of the one who prays is important. Uh, it's not only the words that we pray. Um, we, we can follow the outward form of our Coptic Orthodox spirituality, but Oregon tells us it is the interior character and quality of our heart that determines the value and meaning and substance of our prayers. And we see this in the parable of the publican and the Pharisee, uh, where it is not so much the words which are spoken which uh, cause offence, but it is the disposition of the heart. Uh, and the publican prays with his head bowed down in humility, while the Pharisee who prays with a prideful heart is not heard by God, even though his words uh, are adequate perhaps. Uh, and so here Oregon is asking us when we think about prayer to not just think about how we do it, to not even think about how valuable the Lord's Prayer is, but to go inside ourselves and ask whether we have the proper disposition of one who prays, of one who enters into God's presence uh, to offer praise and supplication, uh, prayers and intercession. Uh, now in the next slides we're going to look in turn at the different phrases in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, I've broken them down into five or six uh, and, and briefly because we do not have a lot of time in this one lecture we're going to look at what each of these three fathers in turn say about these different uh, phrases. Uh, and we begin with Tertullian we're going to look at his explanation of the whole prayer uh, and then Cyprian and then Oregon. And he says the Lord most frequently proclaimed to us that God is Father. Happy are they who acknowledge the Father. It is on these grounds that Israel is reproached. I have begotten sons and they have not acknowledged me. When we say Father, we are also naming God in a form of address which demonstrates both devotion and power. Uh, Tertullian finds in the very beginning of the prayer that almost one of the most important aspects is that we call God Father and that the Lord Jesus teaches us to call God Father. Uh, and it is on these reasons that the Jews are, are reproached uh, because they did not know him as Father even though he had been Father to them uh, through long centuries. Uh, there was something new in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, there was a new approach to God. Uh, and we understand and we give God the name of Father above almost all others. Uh, in our own prayers and in our, in our liturgy, in the Agbeah, in the Tazbihah, uh, we turn to God as Father. Uh, and that is something unique and, and special about uh, the Christian faith. Uh, as Tertullian was saying earlier, it is something new. Uh, it, it's a new revelation of God. Uh, it's the fulfilment of all of the centuries of the Old Testament where God was not quite properly known. But now that Jesus Christ has come as the Son of God, uh, he has revealed God to us as our Father. Not only his Father, but our Father. Uh, and so when we call him Father, Tertullian insists this is not only a form of uh, devotion, as if we loved him and we do love him 
uh, but it is also an expression of his power uh, because in the the family life in the society of the ancient past the father was not simply the man who went to work and brought money home and took care of his family he was the head of the household uh, in an entirely unrestrained manner uh, in many societies the father could do absolutely what he wanted because he had complete authority over his, his family and his children uh, and so Tertullian is, is saying speaking in that culture when we call God Father we are remembering these two things firstly how much we love him and have a personal relationship of warmth with him and second that we remember that he is our father uh, he is the master of this household of faith uh, and we do not go to him as if he is only an indulgent father uh, who will give us whatever we ask for. We go to him as one who has authority, as well as one who loves us. Uh, then on the clause, hallowed be thy name, he says, when we say, let your name be hallowed, we ask that it be hallowed among us who are in him and at the same time in others whom the grace of God still awaits so that we should be obedient to the command to pray for all, even our enemies. Consequently, as a result of this terse or short expression, we do not say, let it be hallowed in us, but manage to say in all people. Of course, the phrase is, hallowed be your name, holy be your name. Uh, and Tertullian is here thinking uh, that when we ask God's name to be to be hallowed, to be honoured, to be respected. Uh, it is first of all in us. Uh, how are we to live so that the name of God is given due respect and honour? Uh, and we know ourselves that we can be in places of work, in places of study, uh, in our homes, in our neighbourhoods, even in the churches. And we can live such a life that we bring dishonour to God. Uh, we understand that, that there is a way that we live which reflects on the glory and honour of God. Uh, not that the glory and honour of God is ever affected by our behaviour, but in this world, before other people, uh, if we are known to be a Christian and we live a bad life, uh, we are unkind, we have no generosity, we have no mercy or compassion, we cheat and are proud and steal, then we dishonour God and we do not hallow his name. Uh, but what is interesting here is that Tertullian wants us to use the Lord's Prayer not in a narrow way just for Christians, this is our prayer, but as though we are praying for the whole world. Uh, and, and when we pray in that way, thinking of all of mankind, then we are praying that God will work out all that is necessary so that in every life, even in those who are our enemies, and Tertullian is living at a time when the Roman Empire was often very hostile to the church, yet he understands that when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we are thinking outwards, and we are praying that in every life, however far from God, uh, it might happen that through the mercy of God, that life also can be transformed so that it brings honour and glory to the name of God, and God's name is hallowed in them. Uh, and so, as, as he puts in the last sentence, we manage to say, for all people, may your name be hallowed in and for all people. Uh, and this is important. Uh, Tertullian and Cyprian and, and Oregon all faced opposition in one way or another from a hostile society around them. Uh, and yet they were not inward looking. Uh, and here in his teaching to those who are going to become Christians, he wants them to understand that we must always be looking outwards, uh, praying for those outside the church uh, as much as for ourselves. Uh, and then in the prayer we pray, your will be done. And Tertullian says, we are asking that his will be done in all people and not because someone is resisting the will of God out of a need to pray that he be successful in implementing it. We ask therefore that the substance and ability of his will should assist us so that we should be saved in both heaven and on the earth because the sum total of his will is the salvation of those whom he has adopted. 
what does he mean here he means that when we pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven we are not praying as if God is unable to work out his will we are not trying to pray so that God will be helped because he has many problems and cannot achieve what he wants on the contrary we are praying that each one of us living here on earth and reposed uh, in the heavens uh, each one of us will find from God all that we need to do his will uh, to be found to be living out his will which is our salvation uh, and so we are asking this again not only for ourselves but for all mankind for all those who are on the earth we are asking that God will give us all that we need so that we can be found to be doing his will because this is our salvation to find that within our heart and within our mind we desire nothing other than to be found in union with God's will is to be saved uh, it is not that we are trying to do things to please God and in the future he may let us into heaven it is that right now in giving ourselves to the will of God by the grace of God which assists us uh, we will discover what it is to live in such a union with God that we experience salvation now salvation is to be doing the will of God uh, and this is why it is important that uh, the Virgin Mary says let it be according to me according to your word uh, she is seen to be being saved experiencing salvation in in that moment and by the expression of such an attitude uh, and that is what is asked of us and that is what we ask of God when we pray that he will give us all we need to enter into this union with his will uh, and then the phrase your kingdom come and Tertullian says when is God in whose hand is the heart of all kings not the king therefore if the open manifestation of the Lord's kingdom pertains to the will of God and to our expectation how could anyone ask for an extension of this world when the kingdom of God for whose coming we pray is directed towards the consummation of this world and then a little later he, he quotes uh, and, and says from the scriptures how long O Lord <coughs> in the first place then just as he's just said about the will of God uh, how is it possible to imagine that God does not already have authority we are not praying that God will somehow become the king and he is having many difficulties in working out that uh, we are rather praying that in ourselves and in all those who live on the world this rule and authority of God as king will become manifest uh, and it has to become manifest first of all in us in the church uh, we have to be those who are seeking first the kingdom of God uh, and only then are we able to share this good news of the kingdom uh, with those who live around us in the world uh, if we are not those who are already seeking the kingdom of God ourselves then we have no good news at all to share with anyone else uh, and we are hardly Christian at all uh, but Tertullian is also saying if we really are praying for the kingdom of God to come uh, then we should not be directed towards worldly things we should not be thinking uh, another five years and I can double the profit in my company uh, another three years and I will be able to buy myself a bigger car uh, we should not be thinking in that way about the extension of our own little kingdoms uh, our own little wealth and our own little property we should be thinking always your kingdom come I am ready O Lord uh, for you to reveal yourself in your power and your glory so that I am like the one who watches in the parable waiting always for the coming of the king uh, it is not that God lacks authority it is that we have not yet manifested that authority of God in our own lives and if the church were to do that if Christians were to do that uh, there would be a transforming and transfiguring effect on the world around us uh, what the world needs more than ever before uh, in a world filled with confusion uh, and violence uh, and discord is that men and women of God in the church are manifesting the kingdom of God in their own lives allowing God to rule over them in every minute 
and in every moment uh, then the kingdom of God will begin uh, to make its way in progression into the world and society around us uh, and then we have the phrase give us this day our daily bread and Tertullian says after petitions for the name of God the will of God and the kingdom of God there is a place for earthly needs Nonetheless, we should understand give us this day our daily bread better in a spiritual sense. Therefore, when we ask for our daily bread, we are asking that we should be perpetually in Christ. For he commands us to ask for the bread which is all that the faithful require, while the Gentiles seek after other things. Uh, and so, uh, firstly, Tertullian is helping those who are being prepared for baptism to see that God does take account of our earthly needs. Uh, that the spiritual life of Orthodox Christians is not one where we give no thought at all for our earthly needs. But Tertullian, even though he takes rather a more practical uh, understanding of the Lord's Prayer, he wants us to understand that it's much better for us to pray for our daily spiritual needs than for our daily worldly and earthly needs. Uh, because the Lord Jesus himself says, Seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things which you need will be added to you. So it could be very possible for us to be someone who prays the Lord's Prayer with warmth uh, and attention. But here, in this moment in the prayer, to be filled with anxiety and thought about our worldly needs. Uh, it is much better uh, and, and a sign of our maturity and our growth in union with God that when we come to pray for our daily bread, we have in mind that spiritual nourishment and sustenance, which will give us the ability to be filled with faith and hope in every struggle, uh, in every condition, for every condition. Uh, and, and in every condition. Uh, so give us this day our daily bread is not, even according to Tertullian, first of all about all of our practical needs. It is about the need for our daily sustenance. Uh, and we can also say, if we're thinking here, uh, that when the bread from heaven, which was given to the faithful in the desert by God, uh, when that was given to them, it was enough provision for the day. Uh, and this reminds us that in our prayer, uh, and especially when we use the Lord's Prayer, we are coming often to ask the God to renew his mercy and compassion to us. Uh, we do not pray once a week, give me all this week that I need. But we pray every day, and even many times every day. We, we pray the Lord's Prayer uh, three or four times when we pray one of the hours from the Agbeah. It is because we must always be reminded to come back to God. Uh, and ask him to give us that which we need. Uh, it is always necessary for us to reorientate ourselves so that we are thinking about our life in a spiritual way uh, and not only in an earthly way. Uh, and then we have the clause, forgive us our trespasses. Uh, and Tertullian says, the Lord knew that he alone was without wrong. So he taught us to pray, pardon us our debts. A debt in scripture is an image of a wrongdoing because wrongdoing always owes a debt to judgment. Our profession is that we too pardon our debtors. And when Peter asked him whether he should forgive his brother 70 times, he said rather 70 times seven. Uh, within the Lord's Prayer, uh, the Lord Jesus had done no wrong. There was no sin in him. Therefore, it was not for himself that he taught us the words, forgive us our trespasses. But he knows that each one of us will fall into sin in various ways. Uh, and Tertullian, uh, in his own uh, translation of the Lord's Prayer into Latin, uh, he's thinking in terms of debts, forgive us our debts. Uh, and we know that the word sin is to miss the mark, hamartia. Uh, it is to miss what we should have done. It is to fail to have hit the target of our life. Uh, and so we are always falling short when we sin. Uh, we are failing to give God what is his due. We are failing to make use of the gifts and the grace and the indwelling life of the Holy Spirit which God has given us. 
Uh, we are always failing and falling short uh, when we quickly abandon our prayer or our fasting or we allow our thoughts to be turned away when we stand in the presence of God in the church. And so we owe God something. Not as if God is a, an angry judge, not as if God is a, a bailiff waiting to knock on our door and, and take all of our possessions, uh, but it means that we are always in a position where we need to come to God in humility. Uh, it is never possible for us to come to God as the Pharisee and say, uh, my Lord, I am, I am satisfied with my life this week. I have done nothing wrong. Uh, I have preserved myself from all sin. Uh, and I offer myself to you in perfection. We can never pray like this. And as soon as we think that we can pray like this, uh, our prayers are not heard by God. Uh, but when we become like the publican, unable to look up to heaven, uh, then we are in the right position, recognising that we have not yet lived out the possibilities of all that God has given us. Uh, and I'm reminded of, of how it is that many of the great saints, uh, in the desert especially, on their deathbeds, when they had lived a life of unimaginable holiness for most of us, uh, they still pray, Lord, I have hardly begun to make a beginning of repentance. Uh, and those around them are astonished and say, how is this possible? But this must always be how we approach God. I have not yet done all that I should have done. I have not yet achieved all that I could have achieved. I have not yet borne all of that fruit that you looked for in my life. And so we always come to God with humility. Uh, and when we are humble with God about our own sins and weaknesses, uh, it is then that we are able to turn with uh, compassion and mercy towards those who have harmed us in various ways. Uh, and so it is not enough for us to forgive once or twice. Uh, and this was why it was so hard for Peter to understand when the Lord Jesus explained. But we must continue to forgive every time uh, as God forgives us. Uh, and indeed, that is the clear teaching of the scriptures and of the church, that we will not be forgiven if we will not forgive others. But here, Tertullian wants to build this sense that we are never such uh, holy, perfect people that we can approach God without humility. Uh, it is always in humility with prostrations and with a bowed head that we come to God, uh, aware that we have not yet done all that we could have done. Uh, and then the phrase, lead us not into temptation. Uh, he added, do not lead us into temptation. That is, do not allow us to be led by the one who tempts. This is laid down so that we should not only request the forgiveness of wrongdoing, but that we should avoid it entirely. The conclusion of the prayer corresponds to and interprets the meaning of these words. Do not lead us into temptation, for it says, but remove us from the evil one. Uh, I, I do not know uh, how the Lord's Prayer is prayed in Arabic, because I, I do not speak Arabic. But in English, generally, uh, in all of our churches uh, and from a young age, we pray, but deliver us from evil. Uh, but the fathers understand the text, and it is written in Greek in the text, the fathers understand the text to be speaking of Satan, the evil one. Uh, it is the evil one who leads us into temptation, not God. Uh, and it is the evil one's grasp that we ask that God will snatch us from and rescue us from. Uh, and, and here we see in a very practical way, uh, in a simple way really, uh, to explain uh, prayer and the Lord's Prayer to those beginning the Christian life, uh, it is not enough to keep coming to God every week uh, and praying, forgive me all my weaknesses. This is necessary, certainly. But God asks of us rather that we overcome those weaknesses. And surely we will find other ones underneath them. Uh, but God is not pleased or honoured by us constantly coming to him uh, and asking for forgiveness of the same things. Uh, and so it is important that at the very end of the prayer, uh, the goal of the prayer we can even say, is that we do not fall into temptation and do not find ourselves in the grasp and the clutches of the evil one. Uh, but rather being snatched from them and rescued from his power, uh, we should see as the goal and the end of our prayer 
uh, that we no longer give way to temptation uh, and that we offer God the fruit of a holy life uh, which is found in those who give themselves more and more to prayer. Uh, then we will turn to Cyprian and, and we'll look at the same phrases uh, and we'll see how Cyprian says some similar things because uh, he relies on Tertullian uh, but he also says things that, that are different and extend his ideas. Uh, our Father in heaven, he says of this, before all else the teacher of peace and the master of unity desires that we should not make our prayer individually and alone, as whoever prays by himself prays only for himself. We do not say my Father, we pray not for one but for all people, because we are all one people together. When we address God as our Father, we should act as children of God. There are a couple of important and wonderful things here. Uh, first of all, that he notices that we are praying our Father. Uh, and he says that whoever prays by himself prays only for himself. Uh, surely this does not mean that one who prays in his own room uh, is not heard by God or does not pray for others. We know that's not true. But the person who is only thinking of himself, the person who thinks he has a unique relationship with God uh, and no one else in the church matters, no one else in the world really matters. Such a person prays only for himself. But in the church, because of God's own will as the teacher of peace and the master of unity, he desires that when we begin our prayer we say our father uh, and when we stand together in church and we pray our father this says something about who we are we are not a collection of 50 or 100 or a thousand individual people who happen to be in the same place but we are a family we are a body uh, we are gathered together in the presence of our Father who makes us brothers and sisters uh, in, in the divine life. Uh, and so we don't only pray for ourselves. More than that, we don't only pray for our congregation. Uh, we don't even only pray for our church. We don't even only pray for Christians. But when we stand in prayer, we are representing in one way all of mankind all of those people around us who do not know God, uh, all of those people who struggle and, and have doubts, all of those people even who have rejected the idea of God, because he also is their father in heaven, so that he is our father, the father of all mankind. Uh, and it is for all mankind that Christ came into the world, and he asks us to pray for them all as one people on the earth. Uh, but importantly, at the end of this quotation, he says, if God is our father, then surely we should act as his children. Uh, if I am sitting with my family, uh, I would expect that someone might notice my children look like myself and my wife. Uh, my grandchildren look like their parents. There is a family likeness. I, I look like my father and my mother. Uh, people can see that, uh, and especially when a baby is born, uh, everyone takes time to discover resemblances between the child and the parents. And it should be the same for us if we are seeking to enter into the spiritual life which we find in the Orthodox Church. If God is our Father, then we must have a likeness to him as his children. Uh, and we can draw from the fruit of the Spirit to give us some idea of what that means. We should be those filled with love, uh, those filled with peace and joy, with patience, with perseverance, with tolerance towards others. All of these things uh, express the, the likeness of God which we should have if we dare to pray our Father. Uh, and then hallowed be your name, St Cyprian says. We say, let your name be hallowed. We say this not wishing that God should be made holy by our prayers, but asking the Lord that his name should be hallowed in us. Indeed, how could God, who is himself the one who hallows, be hallowed? We ask and beseech that we who are made holy in baptism should have the ability to persist in the way we have begun. And we request this every day. We can see here, perhaps, uh, how... Uh, it's possible to see that this is uh, 
a series of teaching which is being given to those prepared for baptism because he speaks about those who are being made holy in baptism uh, and, and again we can see that he reflects what Tertullian has said when we pray hallowed be your name we are not praying it as if God lacks anything uh, we are not praying it as if God is not already holy in his own name but we are asking that his name should be made hallowed in us holy in us respected and glorified in us uh, and how do we do this we do this by living out the life and the grace we received in our baptism uh, nor is this something that needs only to be said to those about to be baptized those of us who are older whatever our age every day we are to be living out persisting in the way we began in our baptism whatever age that was uh, we received the gift of new life we received the gift of union with God we received the gift of the indwelling Holy Spirit uh, so if God is to be hallowed in us all of these things must come alive in us uh, and not only in various seasons in our life but every day and so every day Cyprian says we are asking God renew in us what you began in us in our baptism and chrismation renew it in us again and make it more alive so that people can see when they look at us that we belong to you and that we have your life in us your kingdom come he says we ask that the kingdom of God be made known to us it is indeed possible beloved brothers that Christ himself is that kingdom whose coming we daily desire whose coming we desire soon to see so that we may understand that he is himself the kingdom of God because in him we are to reign our labor of prayer and petition is ceaseless lest we should be excluded from the heavenly realm you can see here why I, I think that Cyprian's explanation is more spiritual uh, Tertullian was talking about the difference between uh, the rule and authority of God in our life uh, and, and the kingdoms of the earth all of those things around us which we can desire but Cyprian is wanting us to imagine and understand that when we pray that the kingdom of God comes we are asking that Christ himself comes into us and becomes our king uh, and we pray this daily because we are daily asking that Christ himself will come and take up his throne in our heart. We want Christ to bring his own kingdom, his rule, his authority over us. So we are not just thinking of it in terms of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of earth. We are talking about it here in Cyprian's teaching uh, about a personal experience, a spiritual experience, which happens every day of Christ coming to reign in us and over us uh, and how do we do this uh, Cyprian teaches us that it is through the labor of prayer uh, a ceaseless labor of prayer uh, and this makes sense because prayer is not asking God for things prayer is essentially entering into God's presence uh, with prostrations uh, with intercessions and supplications uh, with praise uh, with song with all manner of addresses but prayer is not something we say to a very distant God it is bringing us into the presence of God uh, and here when we pray your kingdom come your kingdom come over me now in my heart uh, we are speaking to a Christ who is Emmanuel God with us and within us and so we experience in prayer the very presence of God that we are asking for and this is why our prayer must be ceaseless because as soon as we stop praying as soon as we give up this effort this labor then we fall away from this experience of communion with God uh, we fall away from this experience of God ruling and reigning over every aspect of our being your will be done he says we go on to say let your will be done in heaven and on earth we do not say this so that God might do as he wishes but that we should be able to do as God wishes we are opposed by the devil and our thoughts and deeds are so prevented from complete submission to God so that we pray requesting that the will of God might be done in us 
Nobody is strong in his own strength. Uh, there are some wonderful uh, ideas here. Uh, firstly, we are not so much concerned with God doing what he wills when we pray this. Uh, just as when we pray your kingdom come, we mean that we want Christ to rail, reign over us. So when we pray that the will of God be done, echoing what we heard in Tertullian, we are asking that something should happen to us. Uh, we are asking that this disobedient, rebellious body and mind and spirit should so receive the gift and the grace of God in the indwelling Holy Spirit that finally, at last, little by little, we can start to do as God wishes. Uh, this indeed is where the problem is. Uh, the problem is not outside of us. Uh, I, I pray that God's will be done in a far country dealing with things that I know nothing about. Uh, the problem is uh, God's will is not done in my life because I am rebellious and disobedient. Uh, and even when I wish to do good, my body and my mind are, are rebellious and disobedient. So when we pray again daily, often many times every day, your will be done. We are asking, Lord, give us all that I need to begin to do your will in every moment. Uh, we are asking, Lord, give us all of that strength I need to break free from the opposition of the devil uh, so that my thinking and my doing might be in accordance with what you will for me. Uh, again, with Cyprian, this is a spiritual approach. It is a personal approach. Uh, the Lord's Prayer is being applied to me personally. Uh, it, it's, it's not fine words that lead me to think of God. Uh, they are things that I am asking God to do in my own life and in my heart. Uh, and so we come to give us this day. Uh, uh, this may be understood both spiritually and literally, since both understandings may lead to salvation through the divine plan. For Christ is the bread of life. Consequently, we ask that we be given our bread, that is Christ, daily, so that we may remain in Christ and live through his sanctification and not fall away from his body. The one who has God will lack nothing if he is not lacking in God. Again, this is where we can see the spiritual approach of Cyprian. Uh, Tertullian was uh, interested in us praying for our daily needs, but perhaps thinking more often of our spiritual needs. But here Cyprian sees only uh, the spiritual sustenance which we need. Uh, and again, it's not a spiritual sustenance which is some spiritual influence that we might receive. It is Christ himself. Uh, again, in the words and understanding of St. Cyprian, give us this day our daily bread means give me more of Christ. Give me more of the divine life. Give me more of all of that sustenance and nourishment uh, in my experience of Christ by the indwelling Holy Spirit so that I might live, uh, so that I might be found to remain in Christ and so that I might experience that transformation and transfiguration which shows that I am alive in Christ. Uh, the one who has God will lack nothing. Uh, and so the one who wishes to lack nothing in their life, the one who wishes to become rich, the one who wishes to become fruitful, must be the one who has God in all and through all in their lives, in every moment, uh, in every aspect, uh, in every possibility. Our lives are to be filled with the life and the love and the light of God, which we ask for in these words, give us this day our daily bread. And then forgive us our trespasses. As Cyprian says, how necessarily, how properly and prudently are we reminded that we are sinners and are under obligation to ask on account of our sins so that while the mercy of God is being sought, the mind may be recalled to a sense of its guilt. We cannot obtain that for which we ask on account of our sins unless we do the same for those who have sinned against us. Uh, and this is a necessary aspect of the spiritual life which Cyprian draws out from this prayer. Uh, if we are not aware of our sins, then we cannot obtain forgiveness for them. Uh, it is like someone having some chronic and very dangerous illness, but... but not being aware that is uh, what their problem is 
And so they never go to the doctor or the physician and, and they're never diagnosed and they can never be treated and they can never be healed. Uh, and little by little the disease advances upon them until it brings death. So it is with us daily and many times every day we are called to ask that God will forgive us our trespasses. And this must never be merely a form of words. Uh, it must always include a very strong sense of how we have fallen. Uh, even in the hours since we last prayed this prayer. Uh, in the smallest of things. To become aware that uh, we are not saying words. But we are asking mercy of a personal God who is concerned for us. Uh, so that we have a strong sense. This was not right. The way I spoke to that person. It really mattered and it was not right. Even the way I drove my car, uh, the way I took food from when we had a shared meal, uh, these things matter. And it is only as we have a sense that they represent uh, sin in our life, weakness, frailty in our life, that we can receive healing from God. Uh, the more we have a sense, not of guilt in that crushing uh, sense that drives us away from God, but the more that we have a sense of our illness and sickness, the more we can receive the mercy of God. But we can never obtain that what for which we ask. We can never receive the forgiveness of our sins if we are unable to treat others as also being those dealing with sickness and illness, spiritual sickness, spiritual illness in their own lives. So as we come to seek the mercy of God, we should discover that there is a mercy within us, a compassion within us, even towards those who have harmed us greatly. Uh, and in this we can be sure that we have received from God that which we asked for. Uh, and then, lead us not into temptation. When we ask that we should not come into temptation, we are reminded of our frailty and weakness, even as we are making the request lest anyone should insolently puff himself up. Precedence is given to a humble and submissive confession. When we have said, set us free from the evil one, there remains nothing which should be sought afterwards. Who can be afraid? Uh, uh, again, uh, Cyprian's explanation of this prayer is that it must be a personal and spiritual uh, turning to God. Uh, not a form of words that might please a distant God, but something that represents the disposition of our heart, uh, the quality and character of how we feel about ourselves. And so when we pray, lead us not into temptation, we should be reminded of our own frailty and weakness, uh, that we are not someone who is perfect, that we are not someone who has overcome uh, every weakness in our lives. Uh, and that at the very end of our prayers, we offer ourselves as those who are weak, uh, those who are, are feeble, those who are unable to stand in their own strength. Uh, because God requires of us a humble and submissive confession. Uh, we know that humility is that uh, which most opens up the heart of God towards us. Uh, and the humble heart is not one who thinks uh, little of himself but one who thinks less about himself uh, one who is less concerned about his position uh, and more concerned about his relationship with God uh, the humble heart says this is all I am and I offer all I am to you and I ask for your strength and I ask for your grace and I ask for your mercy uh, to save me uh, from every temptation uh, again, Cyprian is speaking about us being set free from the evil one, not from evil in general, but from a definite uh, malign and wicked spiritual being who, together with his demons, uh, works against us. Uh, and we are praying that God will set us free from his influence. And if we pray this in faith and with hope, then uh, as Cyprian ends uh, in this extract, he says, who can be afraid? Who can be afraid if we have prayed that God will set us free from the power uh, of the evil one? But all of these things, all of these extracts are to do with a very personal response to God, a personal encounter with God, a spiritual encounter with God that makes a difference to me and to the way I live my life. 
Uh, and then briefly we will turn to Oregon uh, and we'll look at the same things and see how there's similarities and differences there. A careful examination of the Old Testament is worthwhile in order to ascertain whether anybody is to be found in it addressing their prayer to God as Father. I have yet to find any. We should be cautious of addressing such an expression to him unless we have become genuine sons. May our entire life pray unceasingly by saying, Our Father who art in heaven. Uh, we, we can see here uh, uh, that Oregon, and if you look at the text in the book, you'll see this even more, Oregon is, is looking at other passages in the scriptures. He, he's trying to do a very detailed and thorough uh, study of the scriptures when he considers uh, both the Our Father prayer and also prayer in general. Uh, and here he has been through the whole, of the whole of the Old Testament. He's trying to see whether this idea of praying to Our Father can be found there. Uh, and he says he can't find it there. It's something new. Uh, but again, as, as Cyprian said, how can we address God as Our Father if we haven't become his children? Uh, at the very least, when we pray our Father, it must convict us and challenge us of those things which are not godlike, not like our Father. Uh, and again, as St. Cyprian was speaking in a spiritual way, uh, Oregon begins his consideration of this prayer by saying that our entire life must be filled with prayer. Uh, the Christian is not someone who does religious things. Uh, the Christian is not someone who prays occasionally. The Christian is essentially someone whose whole life becomes a prayer. Uh, so that in one way or another we offer this prayer, our Father who are in heaven, every moment, every minute, every hour, every day of our lives. Uh, it is as we pray that we discover our salvation in union with God. And it is through prayer that we discover our salvation in union with God. Uh, and so just as we must continue to breathe if we wish to be alive and in health, so for the Christian we must pray unceasingly in all of the ways the church gives us. Uh, if we are to come alive in God and discover that he is our father and we are his children, uh, hallowed be your name. In the case of God, insofar as he is himself unchangeable and is eternally unalterable, the name that he bears is one. We are very properly taught a conception of him as holy in order that we might perceive his holiness as creating, providing, judging, electing, abandoning, welcoming, rejecting. Whoever thinks of God in an unsuitable manner takes the name of the Lord God in folly. Uh, so here Oregon is wanting to say that uh, we are not making God's name holy when we pray this, but we are saying that his name is holiness. Uh, and, and Oregon is wanting to say that, say that everything God does has this aspect of holiness about it. Uh, he creates in holiness. He provides for our needs in holiness. Uh, he judges our lives in holiness. Uh, he welcomes us as a holy father. Uh, and so in our own lives, we have to take on this quality of holiness above all, uh, because this is the name of God. Uh, and holiness doesn't just mean avoiding wrong things. Uh, holiness means to be set apart uh, for a sacred purpose, to be set apart for some special function. Uh, and so as we are asking that God will make his name alive in us, his name of holiness alive in us, we are asking that God will give us all that we need so that we also become set apart in every way uh, for the will and the purpose of God. Just as uh, when we pray the liturgy, the, the, uh, the things on the altar are set apart. Uh, we have a plate, but it is not a plate we use for ordinary food. It is a plate that we only use for the Eucharist. Uh, and we have a cup, but it's not an ordinary cup. It is set apart for a particular purpose. It is made holy for a particular purpose. Indeed, it is anointed with the chrism for a particular purpose. 
And we also have been anointed by God in our chrismation so that we are set apart and made holy for the purpose of God. Uh, so that our own name as children of God becomes holy. Uh, and when we speak of the saints, uh, in English we speak of uh, Saint John or Saint Peter, but, but that word only means holy in the Latin language. Uh, in Greek and in Coptic we, we speak of uh, Agia Petros, uh, holy Peter, because we understand that the Apostle Peter has taken on this name of God which is holy. Uh, and that is a name that we are to take on ourselves. Your kingdom come. It is clear that whoever prays for the coming of the kingdom of God is praying most blessedly for the springing up and the bearing of fruit and the perfection of the kingdom of God within himself. We are commanded by Paul no longer to be subject to the sin which desires to govern us. We are on a pilgrimage towards perfection if we stretch out towards the things ahead of us, forgetful of what is behind. This is why I think that Oregon is, is presenting a more mystical uh, interpretation of this prayer, because his goal is not just that we have a spiritual life, but it is that we enter into union with God. Uh, he wants us to understand that when we pray your kingdom come, uh, we are asking that within our heart, uh, God establishes a throne. Uh, God plants the seed which bears fruit of the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, and he governs over us so that we are no longer subject to the sins which plague us. Uh, we are to be on a pilgrimage towards perfection. Uh, not a pilgrimage towards some sort of satisfactory mediocre life. But we are setting out towards perfection. And we are not dragged backwards by our mistakes and our weaknesses and our faults. We are stretching outwards uh, towards the goal, which is the perfection of our union with God in the heart by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Your will be done. We should pray that in a like manner, in the same way, the will of God should be done on earth by us as it is by them. This will come about when we do nothing contrary to his will. Then we shall be made like those in heaven, bearing like them the image of the heavenly one, inheriting the kingdom of the heavens. So shall we all become heaven. Uh, he has the same idea here, which we find in Tertullian and especially in Cyprian, that your will be done doesn't mean your will be done among other people, but it means especially your will be done in me. Uh, but what I especially want to draw out from Oregon here is this idea, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He desires that each one of us become heaven. <coughs> he desires that each one of us experience life in heaven now. Uh, not only when we die and we hope to go to the heavenly places uh, in the judgment of God, but that our life itself is transformed now from an earthly life to a heavenly life. Uh, and we do this as we slowly, by the grace of God, come to give ourselves entirely to his will. Again, this is why the Virgin Mary is so important, because we understand that when she says, let it be according to your word, she is not just saying, yes, OK, I'll go along with that. She is giving the whole of her heart, the whole of her life over to the purpose of God. And in that one moment, with the giving of all that she had, she became heaven on earth. Uh, and God the Word became present in her as he is present in the heavens. Uh, and this is what Oregon wants for each one of us, that we so give ourselves to God and to his will that our life is translated and transfigured from the earthly to the heavenly. And we already experience partially what it is to live in the heavenly places. Uh, and then give us this day. So the living bread which has come down from heaven is received into the mind and soul of whoever allows himself to receive nourishment from it and it imparts its own power to him. 
This super substantial bread seems to me to be mentioned under another name in scripture, the tree of life. And whoever stretches forth a hand and takes of it shall live forever. Uh, again here, we are speaking not only of, of earthly food, we are not speaking uh, only of Christ coming to nourish us, uh, but we are speaking of that divine food which gives power to us. There is power in the Eucharist, in the bread and the wine which become the body and blood of Christ. And when we receive nourishment from them, we receive this power and life and light and love of God into us, into communion and union with our body and with our mind and with our soul. Uh, and, and Oregon, uh, in, in a way typical of Alexandrian exegetes, uh, he wants us to think of the tree of life in the Garden of Eden in paradise uh, as being this bread which we receive as living bread. Uh, and it is for us, for those who receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus, the living bread which came down from heaven. Uh, it is the tree of life. Uh, and Oregon wants us to understand that as we receive this, it should do something in us because it is a divine power. Uh, it is the power of Christ himself by the indwelling Holy Spirit, uh, which should transform and transfigure even our human and bodily nature, uh, as God wills. Uh, but he says we have to allow ourselves to receive nourishment from it. Uh, it is not that the gift of God is not found in the Eucharist, but we have to commit ourselves to receiving nourishment from it. Uh, from uniting our own effort and ascesis, our spiritual sweat, uh, with this gift of life which God gives us, uh, not only in the Eucharist, but in our experience of communion with him. Forgive us our trespasses. Since we are above all else a creation and formation of God, we are obliged to preserve a particular disposition towards him, namely to love him with all our heart, and with all our strength and with all our mind. Should we not succeed in this, we remain debtors of God, sinning against the Lord. Whoever has been breathed upon by Jesus forgives what God forgives. Again, some of the ideas are similar. This idea that we are debtors when we do not fulfill that which God desires for us. Uh, but here Oregon puts it in the context of us not loving God with all of our heart, all of our strength and all of our mind. Uh, this is a very useful way of understanding sin. Uh, we think perhaps that sin means doing a variety of things that are forbidden. But Oregon, looking into the heart uh, in a mystical sense, sees that every sin is a result of us failing to love God with all our heart, our strength and our mind. And what is required of us is not so much to stop doing particular acts, but to love God more completely. Uh, and when we fail to love God completely, then we become sinners and then we find ourselves debtors before God and we must ask him to forgive us. But to see that each of our sins is a failure to love God completely. Uh, is a very powerful way of understanding our lives. Uh, and then when he says, whoever has been breathed upon by Jesus, uh, and we believe that when Jesus breathed on his apostles, he was giving back to mankind the indwelling Holy Spirit, just as the Holy Spirit had been breathed as the life of Adam and Eve in the beginning. Uh, and then the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the whole of the church. If we have God dwelling within us, the Holy Spirit, then we do not forgive what seems hard. Uh, we do not forgive people who are our enemies. We do not think of it in that way. We understand that we are forgiving whatever God forgives. Uh, and there is a, an infinity to that sort of love, which it can only be found if we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Uh, so we don't only forgive people who have treated us badly, as Tertullian says. We don't even forgive people 70 times 7, as Cyprian reminds us. But we forgive entirely and completely as God forgives, Oregon teaches us. If we truly have the breath of life, 
the Spirit of God living within us. Uh, and then we find uh, in the very last phrase from the prayer in Oregon, lead us not into temptation. We should not pray that we should not be tested, for this is impossible, but that we should not be engulfed by testing, for those who are in its midst are so overcome. It is unreasonable to suppose that the good God who is incapable of bringing forth bad fruit might engulf anyone in evils. When we have done all that is in our power, God will make up whatever is lacking. Uh, and so here, Oregon, at the end of his understanding of the prayer, although he has written a very long uh, treatise about prayer that is worth reading, uh, he understands that when we pray, lead us not into temptation, uh, how do we understand that when in fact much of the scriptures teach us that there is value in our being tested? Uh, and what he wants us to understand is that there is a difference. There is a difference between the testing which we experience in our life and being overwhelmed, engulfed by temptations and circumstances. Uh, and we pray that God will not allow us to come into such a situation that we are overcome by it. Uh, and we should never believe that it is God himself who has brought us to that place. Uh, and uh, the end of the prayer for Oregon is this. When we have done all that is in our power, God will make up whatever is lacking. We are not on our own. Even when we are seeking to live out the Christian life, even when we face temptation and difficulties we are not on our own and if we make the prayer of the Lord Jesus the Lord's prayer our own uh, if we pray it with intelligence uh, and concentration and warmth of heart then we will discover in every circumstance God will make up whatever is lacking that we might bear fruit by the indwelling Holy Spirit that God might become enthroned in our heart as the ruler and king of this kingdom of God, uh, and that we might discover his mercy and compassion so poured out on us that we are able to pour it out on others who have done wrong against us. Uh, in conclusion then, uh, I feel that Tertullian gives a rather practical exposition of the prayer. Cyprian gives a much more spiritual exposition, uh, but Oregon takes it up and wants us to go much further so that uh, we truly enter into a union with God where we experience uh, the power of his personal presence by the Holy Spirit within us. Uh, and all three of these teach us that the Lord's prayer is to be prayed unceasingly. Not as if that's the only prayer we should pray, but prayer and especially this prayer should always be in our hearts and minds. Uh, we are to understand that this prayer contains the whole of the gospel. It represents our need and it represents God's mercy and it represents our life lived in response to God's compassion towards us. And it is an unfailing source of reflections. Uh, if you were interested, uh, you could certainly read these three texts, uh, but there are many others of the great fathers of the church who have written extensively on the Lord's Prayer and even into our own times. Uh, it is a useful source of reflection uh, it is the very words of God himself uh, and as these words become our own prayer uh, filled with uh, attention and understanding to their meaning uh, it begins to have a greater and greater effect on our own spiritual life. Uh, may this be so in each one of our cases uh, for the glory of God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit one God world without end evermore. Amen.